In this video, we'll be going over IRS Form 8857, Request for Innocent Spouse Relief. So this is a pretty long tax form. It's six pages, and you don't file this with your tax return. However, uh, most of the sections are pretty straightforward. Uh, what we're going to do at the beginning of this video is go through some filing considerations, uh, some of the more frequently asked questions about this tax form. Uh, we'll identify some situations where uh, it might be considered innocent spouse relief and some circumstances where it might not be. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is really uh, define what innocent spouse relief is based on the form instructions. So uh, the purpose of this form, uh, under normal circumstances, when you file a joint income tax return, uh, the tax law makes you and your spouse responsible for your entire tax liability. Uh, this is referred to as joint and severable liability. So joint and several, sorry, joint and several liability. Joint and several liability applies not to just your tax bill, but any additional taxes that the IRS uh, determines might be due, uh, whether it's uh, because of income, deductions, credits, uh, whether it's you or your spouse or your former spouse. So if one of you uh, does something incorrect on the tax return, then under normal circumstances, both of you are jointly and severally liable, even if you get a divorce. So uh, the reason innocent spouse relief exists is for people who believe that when you consider all the facts and circumstances, only one spouse or the other should be held responsible for the tax bill. So in this case, the other spouse would be able to request relief from that tax liability any penalties and interests by filing IRS form 8857. Basically, you're kind of throwing yourself on the mercy of the IRS saying, I know that I filed a joint tax return. However, um, based on my situation, uh, I feel like it's not fair to hold me accountable when my spouse did whatever he or she did uh, that you know, underestimated the tax liability, overstated uh, deductions and credits, whatever the case may be. So uh, this happens a lot in, let's say, abusive situations. It happens a lot in uh, situations where one spouse is uh, hiding financial information uh, from the other spouse or where one spouse just simply is handling the finances and does not know what they're doing and tries to do things by themselves without a CPA for far too long. So there's any number of reasons why uh, you may uh, be requesting innocent spouse relief, but to understand this form, you have to understand the IRS's default position, which is if your name is on the tax return, if your signature is on the tax return, you're responsible until you prove otherwise. So I'll start with the first question, which is uh, the difference between innocent spouse relief and injured uh, spouse allocation. So that's probably the most frequently asked question that, that I've received since, uh, since we uh, published this video the first time around. And the difference is uh, injured spouse allocation which is filed on a different tax form uh, is basically a situation where the IRS uh, garnishes a taxpayer's uh, refund uh, to pay down one spouse's debt. For example, let's imagine that John and Mary Doe, they get married, uh, they file their first income tax return, they're expecting a $2,000 refund, and instead they get a letter from the IRS saying, hey, we applied your refund to pay down John's past due child support payments that 
Mary had no idea about. So Mary could take a look at this situation and say, hey, those aren't my child support payments. And when we filed our tax return, I'm responsible for 50% of the income. So we did all everything correctly. Uh, I should at least get my part of that refund back and the IRS should not be able to come after me for it. In that case, you would file what's known as uh, injured spouse allocation IRS form 8379 and you would be able to walk through that completely separate tax form in order to uh, claw back the spouse's part of the refund that was taken by the IRS. Uh, we can put links in the show notes to uh, resources about that tax form, the IRS collections process, uh, what's known as the Treasury Offset Program. So we'll put that in there for people that might be walking through uh, trying to figure out which form to file. So let's uh, now take a shift to just briefly reviewing the different parts of this form. There are seven parts to this six page tax form. Uh, part one, uh, should you file this form? So you're answering basic questions uh, to get to uh, the root of the matter so that you can then make a decision on whether this is the correct form for you. In part two, you're gonna provide the Internal Revenue Service some information about yourself and the person that you're listing uh, uh, that you want innocent spouse relief. So basically you're saying, this isn't my fault. This is completely their fault. In part three, you're going to explain to the IRS what involvement you had in the finances and in tax return preparation for the tax years that you want relief. Part four, you're going to discuss your current financial situation. Uh, part five is optional. This is a part that you may complete if you are cons if you consider yourself to be a victim of domestic violence or abuse. And if there's certain information that you do not want uh, to go on the form or if you need to have separate conversations with the IRS. Part six contains additional information that you want to share with the IRS. And then part seven indicates whether or not you would want to have a refund. And then below that is the taxpayer signature field. If you are using a paid preparer, uh, like a CPA, then you would put that uh, person's information uh, below there, below that part. So let's go to the top. And before we start uh, going through part one, let's talk about these important things you should know. So uh, first of all, uh, you're not going to file this with your tax return. You're going to file it separately. That's important to know. Uh, you're going to uh, probably need to take a look at the instructions in the form. And if, if you need to, there's a separate IRS publication, publication 971 that completely uh, is devoted to innocent spouse relief. Then this should help uh, you understand the factors that the IRS is going to consider when deciding to grant innocent spouse relief. For example, uh, you know, a person in an abusive situation uh, with little to no f uh, formal education beyond high school will probably receive more of the benefit of the doubt than, say, uh, a CPA that isn't in an abusive situation. Just all things being equal, the IRS will probably take a look at one situation and say, this is a spouse that you know probably did not have much of a choice or did not have uh, the, you know what we would expect to be you know the, the the requisite education. So if they depended on their spouse for the finances, you know, let's give them a little bit more consideration than the person that took the CPA exam and should know a little bit more about how taxes work. Uh, you're going to complete uh, attach the complete. Uh, the complete copy of any document that was requested or that you believe will support your request for relief. Uh, 
the IRS is required uh, by federal law to notify the person, uh, so your spouse or your formal, former spouse will have the opportunity to uh, participate. Uh, they're going to complete a questionnaire about the tax years that you have considered uh, for innocent spouse relief. However, they're not going to disclose your name, your current address, your phone numbers, or your employers. So there is kind of a layer of identity protection. Um, you can petition the tax court, uh, but they may only be allowed to consider uh, certain information that you provided before the IRS made a final determination. Uh, any other information uh, that was included in your file that the IRS provided, uh, and then any information that is either newly discovered or previously wasn't available. So uh, if, you, if you hold back information from the IRS and they make a determination, and then you decide to go to tax court, you can't then present this information that you've been sitting on. Uh, that, that, that's just not how the process works. So uh, make sure that when you give the IRS the information that you want them to consider, that you're giving them the entire picture. That's basically what the IRS is saying. So uh, there are a lot of narratives in here, a lot of written explanations. So we're going to walk through this form uh, in the fictional scenario of Mary Doe, who is filing for a divorce from her husband, John Doe. And this is a situation where she depended on him to do all the finances. Uh, she, you know, they had what you might consider a traditional uh, marriage where uh, she uh, was, uh, her primary duties were managing the house and, uh, and uh, raising their children, uh, or their child in this case, uh, Susie Q. Doe. And then John was uh, the uh, primary breadwinner who went out on travel, uh, business-related travel, and as we'll discover going through this form, uh, we'll just find out that he, um, you know, kind of got into trouble uh, early on uh, and kind of tried to play some financial games to keep on top of the taxes, but then everything eventually, you know, kind of came crashing down. And now uh, Mary is trying to get out from under John because she believes that this situation is you know, not tenable for her and their daughter. And uh, she doesn't believe that she should be responsible for the taxes that have now started coming, coming across their plate. So in part one, uh, we're going to go through step by step. Uh, so, uh, hey, first of all, should you file this form? So you're going to have to read this statement. Uh, generally, both taxpayers who find a, file a tax joint return are responsible jointly and individually for paying any tax, interest, or penalties from your joint return. If you believe the person with whom you filed a joint return should be solely responsible for an erroneous item or an underpayment of tax from your joint return, you may be eligible for innocent spouse relief. Innocent spouse relief may also be available if you are a resident of a community property state and you did not file a fed joint federal income tax return and you believe that you should not be held responsible for the tax that is attributable to an item of community income. So question number one, do either of these paragraphs above describe your situation? So in this case, Mary believes that uh, uh, the first paragraph applies. Question two, did the IRS take your share of a joint refund from any year to pay any of the following past due debts owed only by your spouse? Child support, spousal support, student loan, or other non, uh, federal non-tax debt, or federal or state taxes. So this is the part where uh, you may uh, be diverted to file IRS form 8379. That's the injured spouse allocation. So if not, this is clearly the situation where uh, Mary Doe believes she qualifies for innocent spouse relief. Uh, 
if you determine that you should file this form, enter the years that you want innocent spouse uh, relief. So, uh, so you're going to, so in this case, 2022 and 2023. So if the IRS offset a tax refund for a prior tax year, for example, if they used your 2020 tax refund to pay a 2018 joint tax bill, then you would enter the 2018 uh, year, not your 2020. So in part two, we're going to complete these uh, information fields. First, you're going to answer whether or not English is your primary or preferred language. But if not, then you would indicate, you know, whatever your preferred language is. Um, and uh, box five, we're going to enter your name, social security number, the address where you wish to be contact contacted. Uh, so this is where the IRS will send all of their written correspondence to you. Uh, uh, you, you can list... Uh, a preferred time to be contacted. So uh, the, sorry, I misread this section here. This is where you should put your daytime telephone number, not your preferred time to call. So let's put Mary's phone number here. And then if the IR, if you want the IRS to leave a voicemail, uh, if they can't get a hold of you. So uh, if you have a change of address, um, if this is if, if you check the box here, uh, the IRS will send all of your correspondence to that address. If you don't check it, they're going to send your original correspondence to this item right here. Uh, but they have to send all other correspondence to your official record. So if you want the IRS to update your records, to use this line five address, uh, then you may need to uh, file IRS form 8822, which is the official change of address form. In line six, so in this case, she lists the house that they're currently living. Uh, they have not yet moved, but it, it appears that they're still uh, married uh, she's still trying to kind of figure things out, but at this point, John's not even helping at all. So um, we've listed her name at the top of this form. We li we've listed John's information, uh, and then his phone number would be So marital status, if you're married and living apart, you would enter the date, or if you're widowed, legally separated, or divorced, then you would attach a photocopy of whatever that supporting documentation looks like. In line eight, you're going to list the higher, highest level of education that you had completed uh, when, you, when you filed your tax return. So uh, if you had any college level business or tax related courses, you would list them there. In line nine, you're going to indicate um, whether or not you had a mental or a physical health problem, or if you have one now. So let's just say that mental and physical health are not considerations here. But if there were, then you would attach a statement, or you would provide photocopies of any medical bills, a doctor's report, anything to that effect. And then uh, line 10 is the first box that you would check if there's information that you're willing to provide, uh, but you don't want it written down. And again, this might happen in certain cases, definitely where, um, you know, intimidation or abuse uh, situations uh, might be applicable. Uh, there might be information that uh, that reporting spouse would be willing to provide. They just don't want to put it uh, on paper. So in part three, you're going to start telling your stories, right? So did you intend to file a joint tax return? Well, I mean, I selected a hypothetical situation here where this was just a matter of a trusting wife going along with her husband that handles 
pretty much the financial matters. If this was an abuse situation, this could be completely different. Maybe you would say, no, I never intended to file a joint return, but, you know, my husband threatened me. You know, whatever the case is, you know, kind of flush that out. I'm using one-liners here, but there is space provided so that you can write uh, as much information as, as you need to. And this is your story, so you should tell it. Um, so in this case, Mary trusted her husband with everything. He told her to sign the return. She signed it without really asking much in the way of questions. There we go. So, you know, just a little bit of, you know, tiny things, you know, sometimes, you know, financial distress doesn't really involve what might look like traditional abuse, but this could be considered financial abuse right here. You know, just, you know, someone kind of saying, don't ask these questions, mind your own business. And the fact of the matter is when it comes to finances, you know, for a married couple, Joint finances are both spouses' business, and that's the default position that the IRS has. So, um, you know, if you're dealing with this in the past tense, I, I, I'm so sorry, but, you know, this is the expectation that you kind of need to flesh out uh, when explaining your situation to the IRS. So in line 12, we're going to walk through your, dis your involvement in preparing the tax returns. So did you gather any, any of the documentation? Uh, did you review the returns before they were filed? Um, So in, in box 13 or line 13, you're going to explain what you knew about the income. So, um, you know, this is where a lot of situations, things come out of the woodwork. In this case, hey, John told me he got a huge pay raise at work. Uh, one time I, I asked him how it, this was going to affect your taxes, and he told me not to worry about it, that he would just take care of it. Uh, and we got a refund every day, every year. So in line 14, you're going to explain what you knew about any missing information, um, whether or not you asked, uh, whether or not you knew any incorrect information was on those returns, even if you didn't know that it was incorrect when they were filed. Uh, if there's a deduction or a credit, were you aware of any facts that made that allowable or not allowable? Uh, so this is kind of where you say, hey, you know what? I, I didn't know John was leaving information out of the returns. One time I asked him if we should have a CPA do it, and he told me he, was new, he knew that he, what he was doing. In line 15, if the returns showed a balance due to the IRS, explain when and how you thought the balance due would be paid. In this case, Mary didn't have any suspicions because we never owed money. We always got a refund. And I didn't realize that this was because John was taking uh, fake deductions. Inflating tax credits. Uh, describe any financial problems. So, you know, taxes usually are not the only financial problem uh, that are at hand. Uh, most people uh, may... Many people may be trying to kind of just play a shell game like, hey, this month I got to pay my taxes to get the IRS off my back. So I'm going to take a loan and then next month I'm going to worry about making payments on that loan. And then, well, if I'm behind on those payments, now I got to take out a credit card so that I can get some cash advance. And a lot of people just kind of play the shell game where they keep borrowing money to pay off other you know, lenders until everything collapses. So in this case, Mary didn't know that they had any problems because John didn't present them to her. In line 17, 
Uh, describe how you were involved in the household finances and your role in deciding how money was spent. So I was in charge of household shopping and balancing the checkbook. If our checking account ever got low, I would tell John and he would transfer money from a savings account that he managed. I didn't know that he was mo borrowing money to keep us afloat. So I want to take a pause right here and I'll give you a personal story of, of a good friend of mine who passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, th this is a situation where there was no abuse. There was no, you know, this was a, a married couple that loved each other. Uh, he died suddenly and his wife asked me to come in and take a look at all of the finances. And I was his best friend. Uh, so I thought I knew just about everything about him that I possibly could. And it turns out that I knew next to nothing about how his finances were working. And uh, so and neither did his wife. And a couple days later, I basically had to sit down with her and tell her, hey, uh, he died with less than nothing. And the only thing that you can really do is uh, walk away from, you know, the debt that he owed because it was all in his name. And, you know, so this is the kind of unfortunate situation that um, I'm, I'm kind of embellishing here, but it happens a lot more often than people think. And this is the kind of situation or the relationship where a lot of families do this in a functional manner. Uh, one person does certain uh, specific tasks and another per the other person, the breadwinner, counts the money, manages the money. I mean, that's a perfectly, you know, a fair description of how a lot of households work. It also works this way in households where the finances aren't working out that well and sometimes those end tragically. So um, don't be afraid to write your story here, even if it doesn't sound, if it sounds like it's embarrassing, like you should have known better, you're going to have to work through those feelings to get the IRS on your side. And remember, your goal is to get out from under a tax bill that you don't think you should be held responsible for. So in line 18, for the years that you want tax relief, did you or the other person incur any large expenses or purchases? So you can say, hey, yes, uh, John went away a lot on business and I thought it was paid for by the company. I didn't know he was buying jewelry for his girlfriend, right? So uh, line 19, did the person transfer any assets to you? Sometimes when the sh sharks, sharks start circling, uh, someone might uh, start titling assets in the other spouse's name. Hey, don't worry about this. We're just retitling some things to you know, do some planning. And maybe, maybe you don't know why uh, these things are happening, but they could be happening. And it might be completely justified in that other person's head. Maybe it's a temporary setback in their mind until they can get back on their feet. Uh, whatever the case may be, uh, the IRS is going to specifically ask if you received any assets that were transferred in your name. And again, the most likely reason to do that is for creditor protection with, with some mistaken notion that creditors aren't going to go after the other person. In part four, you're going to outline your assets, your uh, income and expenses, and your liabilities. So in this case, there's a house and a car at stake. Um, you can list, you know, whatever um, other, you know, significant items. It could be motor vehicles, investments. So in this case, they don't really have much in the way of investments. They just have a house and a car. Uh, and Mary Jo Doe is currently supporting two people. Um, so she's kind of drawn out her monthly income. She's receiving some money from, from family as gifts. She's had to take on a side job. Uh, and she's, she's trying to collect unemployment uh, or government assistance. Let's just change this to government assistance. If she's working, then that's not really unemployment. But whatever the case may be, if you have a business, if you have child support, alimony, list your uh, income. And then on the next page, you're going to list your expenses. Uh, food and personal care, transportation, housing and utilities, medical expenses, 
and then other expenses. These are often categories that the IRS will use to kind of sit down and uh, kind of run through a formula of what is necessary uh, to keep up your house. And whenever they're making a subjective uh, decision like this, it's usually based on, you know, them kind of evaluating numbers and saying, hey, this is within reasonableness. Uh, for example, if you said I spend $4,000 a month on food, they'd probably say for two people, what are you eating? So, you know, put down your expenses and then, you know, and then the IRS will decide whether or not they agree or disagree. But in this case, you can kind of clearly see that Mary is making less money than what she's putting out. And if the IRS decides uh, that these are fair and reasonable expenses for her household, uh, then they may they might may have enough information here to say, hey, you know, Mary, it would not be uh, fair for the federal government to hold you responsible for this debt. Uh, we're going to kind of work you out of this and approve your uh, uh, innocent spouse relief, and then we'll go after John. And again, as part of the investigation, John gets to tell his side of the story. So in part five, you don't have to complete this unless you were or are a uh, victim of domestic violence or abuse. So uh, IRS publication 971, uh, that's the... Uh, that's the Innocent Spouse uh, publication, uh, has additional information. Uh, you can also call uh, the National D Domestic Violence Hotline. Uh, so you would enter either yes or no. And if not, then you would just go straight to part six and keep going. Uh, so in this case, Mary is alleging that there was some sort of abuse. Uh, it doesn't specify here what it was, but it will ask more information. So in part B, hey, this is Mary's story. Uh, things got worse over time. And as they got worse, um, you know, she became increasingly scared of John. So if you do put that in there, you're going to need to provide documentation, whether it's police reports, medical records, again, anything that you currently have access to. Now, there may be things out there that you don't have access to that uh, become available later on. And so if this goes to the IRS uh, and you gave them everything that you had at the time and you choose to maybe appeal in tax court, uh, you can present new information that's come up. What you can't do is only sit, you know, you're only going to give part of the medical records or part of the police report and then you present everything in tax court you know, that's information that the IRS should have had when they're making this uh, decision. In part six, this is your story. You're going to provide any additional information that you want the IRS to consider about either this, th the years that are on the form or any years that you filed a joint return uh, to help them make a decision. In part seven, you'll check the box if you uh, want a refund uh, in the case that you qualify for relief, but you already paid the tax. And then at the bottom, you're going to sign, you're going to provide the, uh, uh, if your CPA is or tax preparer is uh, completing this form, you're going to provide their signature as well. So uh, if you want your CPA to be involved, you can give them a certain representation, uh, power of attorney privileges by completing IRS form uh, 2848. If you want them to receive copies of correspondence from the IRS, uh, you can sign IRS Form 8821, which gives them access to certain tax information. So um, that's all we have for this video. Uh, there's a lot here, uh, but most of it is your story and kind of telling it. So uh, be thoughtful, be considerate. Uh, if you need more information, our article goes through a lot more detail, uh, particularly types of relief that you may be eligible for, what falls under the innocent spouse relief umbrella, uh, and then kind of what happens to your form when, when the IRS receives it. So if you want more information, you can 
go to our website, type in IRS Form 8857, and you should see our article up here. So we'll also put links in the show notes to any other uh, articles and videos that we've created about uh, some of the forms mentioned here. Uh, if you like our articles, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you like our videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, comments, or if there's another topic that you'd like to see in an upcoming video, please hit me up in the comments section. Thank you very much and have a great day.